Hi, everyone. Welcome to another book discussion between Ann Arbor District Library and Honoris Book Club. We are here tonight to discuss the novel East Goes West by Young Hill Kong. Uh, before we get started, we could just quickly go around and introduce ourselves and give a brief visual description. I'll start. My name is Lucy. I work at the library and um, I love doing these book discussions. I am a 51 year old white female with shoulder length brown hair. I'm wearing glasses and I'm sitting in front of a yellowish wall with some books behind me. Hi, I'm Emily. I am a librarian at AADL. Uh, I am a white woman in my mid thirties. I have long reddish hair that I'm wearing in two braids that extend down beyond the bottom of the screen. I'm wearing a navy t-shirt and I'm in front of a mostly white wall with a print of Matisse's goldfish behind me. Hi, I'm Anne. I am a book processor. I primarily work out of the Westgate branch. I am a mid-40s white woman with glasses and shoulder-length brown hair. I'm wearing a burgundy library sweatshirt sitting in front of a white wall and miscellaneous stuff behind me. Hi everyone, I'm Fatima Hawk. I am a co-facilitator for the Unerased Book Club. I am a Bangladeshi uh, woman in her mid thirties um, and wearing a black sweater with black hair pulled back. And uh, I have a digital background of the Chittagong skyline. Um, that's my background, glad to be here today. Hey everyone, I'm Sheila. I'm the founder of Unerase Book Club and other co-facilitator alongside Fatima. Um, I'm an Indian American woman in my early 30s wearing a purple sweatshirt and it's a blurred background behind me because I have a, a lot of stuff behind me. Nobody needs to see it. Um, so just to give a little context about this book before we start, this is one of the first Asian American authored um, novels um, ever published. It's an exceptional um, it's an ex exceptional book because it deviates away from the idea of having to be a cultural translator um, or having to explain away what's happening in Asia at the time, as was common with most Asian or whatever you want to deem as Asian American at the time, authors were doing. Um, it is a pretty dense novel. Um, I actually haven't finished it. I'm about halfway through. Um, and it is it can be kind of uh, intense in the writing, not in the content, but it, it does, there's a, a, the author packs a lot of punches in it. So I'm really excited to get into it. We have a small but mighty group. I'm sure we're going to talk pretty in depth about, about the writing and about the themes. So I'm just going to open it up uh, like we normally do and ask, what did you all think about the book, however far you got? It makes me feel a lot better to hear from you all um, that this one was a bit of, it was more challenging to go through than pretty much everything else that I've read for this group. Um, I'm really grateful that it gave context, at least in the edition that I had. It had both a forward and an afterward. Uh, I was listening to the audiobook. That was how I was able to track down a copy. Uh, and I will say today I was racing. So today I started listening to it at 1.25 speed, but I made it to the end about 15 minutes ago. And I'm really glad that I did that because I got so much out of the afterword in the edition. It gave a lot more context that, and it was, I think, some of the repeated context that I got in the foreword, but after having read it, uh, because I think what I am taking away most from this book is more the story of how the author wrote it and the discussion around some of the decisions he made about what elements of his life to include and the decisions to, like you said, perhaps not follow the set aside path for how people might have expected his story to be told. Um, but it was very dense. And I had to keep reminding myself that it was written in the 1930s. And so it's just a, a different style of reading and pacing and things that sometimes would frustrate me both with like the context of which characters, especially characters of many different backgrounds are discussed or like uh, how little women are in the story and the ones that are, how they are um, 
perhaps not very well explored, I had to keep reminding myself what the context of the time is. I think one of the things that you run into with the context of the times is that so often it felt like issues that we're still dealing with today. So it would feel like kind of a contemporary take on something, but not at all. Yeah, I totally agree with it. Like it did have this weird timelessness to it, but then also you felt like you at sometimes were reading it almost not like a, a foreign language, but it just was so um, verbose in parts that it sometimes I felt was hard to like stay on track. Um, I the for like the first half of this novel, I don't know. I would I would find myself being occasionally engaged, but I oh, it's kind of just like uh, it's, this is tough. And then all of a sudden something clicked, and I got pretty into it, and I got into the story. And then I would have these moments where I was just like pulled in and so into the the book and reading, and I was like, whoa, what just happened? And then these moments of like, what are you talking about right now? Like you have just listed fifteen poets, and you're you know, um, so it was a really interesting mix but I thought um I thought it told like such a detailed story about like different ways that people assimilate and the need to assimilate and then also there were times when I thought it was really funny um like kind of got Mark Twain feelings of, of humor but with a totally different lens um so it, it was surprising to me but it was definitely a lot of work this yeah. is the first book that I participated in the discussion for that felt like an assignment. Um, but unlike a lot of books that I got assigned over my collegiate career, I am very thankful that I read this because it is such a different perspective um, from a different era that, you know, I just have not explored at all. Yeah, I would... As someone who generally likes like period pieces, not in literature, but more in television. So I was thinking a lot about um, the Gilded Age, for example, and like that being set in New York and this novel also being set in New York. Um, something about the social norms of that time just like intrigues me because there's so many of that, that so much of that in this novel, right? So I actually appreciated it for the fact that it, it was detailed enough to like give you the full universe in a way of what the these folks were going through. It was a slog, absolutely, as everybody has said. But I really liked learning about the social norms because some of the things that he was doing where it was like all the hitchhiking for like a couple of years or um, just like with letters of introduction, suddenly like finding people and finding home and finding work and all of that is just um it was amazing to me because I was like oh you try to do that today and you're not gonna fly at all you know like what are the odds that you would hitchhike with a senator who then promises to help you repeal a anti-Asian law when it gets on the docket, right? So so I was really fascinated by all of the social norms and uh, discussions around it. The first part of the book, I was really curious, like, where is this even going? But I think um, in the second part, like it really, I felt engrossed in it. And in the third part, I rolled my eyes quite a bit. So that's my that's my feelings about it broadly. So I got sidetracked from this book by another book that is a similar length. Uh, it's also about 300 pages and or a little. Yeah. And I realized as we're talking that a lot of contemporary literature is written for short attention spans. Even if it's long, like it doesn't take you on little side quests and it doesn't dig. It doesn't like make you stop and think not like that's it's a good or bad thing but you're not having to slog your way through the writing to get back onto the main quest um and that's like to everyone's point it's definitely a byproduct of when this was written and who it was written for because it was not intended to be i don't think he was thinking oh 
80 years from now, people are going to be reading this and let's hope that they have, they have the same touch points or cultural touch points to understand all the different parts of it. Um, and Emily, like you actually had to start listening to it, uh, cause reading it was really difficult. Um, and once I started listening to the audiobook, I really got into it pretty quickly. I was surprised that I was finding so much in common with, again, a book written by a Korean man in the thirties. Um, but like his, uh, at the beginning, uh, when he meets George, um, and is both amused, curious, I guess, amused, curious, and confused by all of the small things he's doing to win at romance and like his hot takes on what are like, what is the Western conception of love versus the Korean idea of love? Um, and why you must know how to press your pants a certain way and women will look. And I was like, who like listening to this on a walk in sweatpants. I'm like, yes, women will look at those creased lines <laughs> and judge you based on that. Um, I just I feel like his interactions with George again up until the halfway mark where I'm currently at um, have been very amusing to Lucy's point about it, parts of it being funny. I I like that um, Han kind of ends up in the the middle ground and you've got George showing this um, very kind of Americanized, modernized perspective. And then there are other characters throughout um, where they're just a lot more conservative in their worldview or, or um, Kim, who is just, well, I, I think he's got some mental health issues that he dealt with throughout his life and his depression very much impacts the way he sees society. Yeah, I I would have to say one of the things I was scared about reading like a book from the 1930s was like, what am I going to find that, that it's totally inappropriate, like racism, right? Like, I'm like, what am I going to see? Um, Anti-Blackness, for example, or other topics. But I thought that he treated, there are so many characters in this book. There's like a hundred people mentioned throughout, right? Or more. And he treats everyone with a lot of fairness using terminology of the time yes but he describes them with fairness and then i think like describes their behaviors and actions and even gets the tone of their voices to be very individualized so whether he's discussing discussing missionaries or um you know i guess cult leaders in a little bit uh or, you know, other Asians or Jewish people or, you know, Black people. I feel like he he did everyone a bit of service in that um, and was quite fair. Minus the women that were like very, yeah. But to, to be fair, he didn't spend much time with them at all. So. Yeah, I think one way that um, I found that well, like the the narrative voice, but also the author was successful at doing that, at introducing all those people, is that like Han would sort of um, pull back from the story, like become this like quieter voice when we were meeting new people so that those people really could come forward and shine, um, which gave you an insight into them. But I also think helped like create that kind of absurdity with a lot of them because they're just going on about, you know, I don't know what are their total scam artists or um, they're contradicting themselves. But because we weren't hearing about that, like we weren't being told that by someone, it, it, it made them seem like they were all being treated equally because we were hearing from them. Um, and so there's just a, such a wide, varied cast of characters that whose voices we got. That was one of the things I struggled with the most was keeping track of characters, especially because some of them are just, they're passing and some of them you think are passing and then they come back. And I spent some time um, looking online to see if I could find a character list and I, I was not successful. So I will say if by any chance someone is watching this and planning to read it, uh, I recommend making a character list as you go through uh, because, you know. We, as we've said, it's not like a breeze of a read. And so it is one that you need to 
you're going to be engaging with if you do anyway. So might as well go all in. I wish I had. Uh, but by the time I got the idea to do that, I was halfway through the book and just decided, uh, well, I'll either figure it out or I won't. Um, because I think I would have gotten more out of it if I was not frequently trying to figure out, wait, now who is this again? Where are we again? Because it does cover such a wide span of time and areas. Um, and you just kind of keep going. Uh, there, are at least perhaps in the print book, there's more clear delineation. Um, but other than the fact that it was it's broken up into books and parts and chapters, there's not you know, reminders at the beginning that now we're in Boston, now we're in Philadelphia, now we're in New York, um, which again, is probably just a thing of being a modern reader that I'm used to more of that handholding those things provided at the beginning of chapters for books where locations change and things like that. It also seemed like he was bouncing between Boston and New York City quite a bit. <laughs> it just, um, but I started, I also started with the print book and finished with the audio book, um, but then went back with the print book because I realized that there were characters that were not the same people that in my brain I had just merged into one person, but one of them lived in Boston and one lived in New York, and I was just conflating the two things. So it is definitely... It's easier to get through as the audio version, um, but it is a little bit easier to lose track of who people are. Um, I had two very different thoughts. The first is I tried to use ChatGPT to give me a summary of this book out of curiosity. It did a horrible job. It gave me eight chapters. I was like, don't know where this came from. There's not even like... It eight parts broadly that that doesn't even exist um and it said it starts off in san francisco and so i had to like reread the beginning multiple times i was like did i miss this completely um and i didn't it was just wrong and so it goes to show like when a book is has longevity but isn't super popular in the overall zeitgeist um it is very easy to misconstrue or just put what you want out on the internet and people will just assume that that's correct uh and then the other thought related thought is uh, Lucy and you were saying that each character becomes like this. They kind of satirize themselves in this, uh, in the format that, um, that um, he writes in. I was thinking about the livelies, this family that he meets when he comes back after, after his first year of school and he's trying to get a job. And, but as you were introduced to the livelies, I just like can feel how much his family hate the family hates Mr. Lively. And it cracked me up. Like the wife wants nothing to do with him, wants him to like just kind of shut up and go away or like do his own thing and leave them alone. And to see that glimpse of um, how a lot of like white men will think that their family unit is perfect and is one that all should aspire to with the reality of his home life. Um, again, against like this idea of Orientalism and or in the, his case, like xenophobia of like, oh, ours is better than yours. And like Easterners should aspire to what, how we have family. All of that in one, like two, like I think one or two pages was just really brilliant. It's like a really beautiful way of pulling all of that out um, and showing all the minor hypocrisies that lead into a much bigger hypocrisy around the idea of family units um, and which one is the correct one. Um, and then on top of that, like that little glimpse of, um, women i because i haven't gotten far enough to see how they treat women later but um that like one woman's character has a backbone doesn't really want to like put up with like doesn't entertain her husband's nonsense that's fun i like laughed well like i had to re-listen to it a few times but i laughed each time yeah that was definitely a section that had me laughing um now, was that, this might be the conflating of characters, but um, was Mr. Lively also the one who essentially had like the MLM sort of selling of the books? Mm -hmm. And that, well, like reading that and reading the class where he, or listening to the class where these, they're teaching these people how to sell the books. And it, like, that just hit me as like, oh my gosh, this is, first of all, still very relevant, but like such great satire. And I am sure 
that each of these scenes have those moments and just some of them don't carry over the same relevance uh, to today. I feel like this is one of those books that I would love to be taught, um, both to break it down, but then where I could get the context of the scene. And that was what I was kind of, you know, when I, I realized when I couldn't find a character list, there was no way I was going to find like a part by part breakdown. Uh, but gee, I, I, I would love one because I, I know so much went just right past me. Yeah, I was thinking this is a book that you could spend, um, like to really get the most out of it, to spend a long time with and the whole time discussing with people, like a class, because I think there are things that you can just be reading as like, oh, this is really an autobiographical novel. But it's like, is that just actually the way that Kong was writing the book? Because that was his in, like that's what he could write. Um, but then really giving us so many different satirical points about so many different, um, you know, facets of really of the United States, but then of, of many other cultures. So I, I would have loved, you know, I would, it would be so interesting to just really be able to, with other people, break down, you know, all the, the various parts of it. Yeah. And I, <clears throat> you know, I don't, I think based on the content of the book that this is not the book that he could have written only book that he could have written, right? Just like the the breadth of understanding of Western literature and poetry and everything else. And also Eastern materials too, right? This Even in this book, I kept expecting there to be some sort of flashbacks or some deeper connection to Asia or Korea. But, but aside from like mentions of the like maybe very slight mentions of Korea being um, occupied by Japan or Chinese influences in Korea or other things. He doesn't really spend a lot of time romanticizing or describing or in any, in any form. Um, part of that might also be because it, his first book, um, I, I heard in an interview that his first book actually took place in Korea and um, that this the main character for this book was actually a minor character in the other book as a, like he was a child in the other book. And so I thought, oh, maybe he did that work first. Like he kind of got that story out and now he could just really focus on his time in America, which I thought would be just as interesting. But I, I really liked getting a picture of what life was like for Asian Americans in, um, in New York and Boston and the East Coast in general um, during this time, I thought that like he really offered a comprehensive view of that. I'm completely stealing this idea from I'm just parroting from the afterward, but I thought it was so interesting um, and talking about how it is, you know, what we today might call auto fiction. Um, and he talked about how the any criticisms of America come from other characters' mouths. They don't come from Han's mouth. And I had not really put that together in reading it, but thought it was such a fascinating way because this way he could present the criticisms, but it is not the character that everyone assumes is him uh, saying them. And I thought just like, what a what a thoughtful way to be able to Get your opinion out there, but also not jeopardize the, you know, his ultimate goal of citizenship and continuing to be able to write and all of those things that this could have gone very sideways if he was portrayed as um, being critical of the American experience. I think it's really interesting that he, Han, the character, starts off with almost a more white supremacist worldview. Like he's got America on a pedestal that kind of disappears over the course of the book, not to the point where he's 
you know, saying America is awful or anything. He's just come to the conclusion that it's not this rosy place that he was thinking it would be. Um, yeah. Yeah. He, um, I, I thought the descriptions of place like cities specifically, um, mostly in New York were really, really, um, interesting and like New York was almost as not a character of its own but it was such an important part the way it was laid out and like when he's talking about Chinatown um and even when he talked about Boston a little bit he was just so very specific about place like we got street names and we got um you know just very real descriptions um I don't know what this point has to do with anything anyone else has said, but <laughs> something made it pop into my head and I wanted to mention it. No, I love it. I I thought, <clears throat> I felt that too. I was like, oh yeah, Fifth Avenue. We all know that. Or, you know, like all the different places that he was naming, he was like, oh. And again, some of it also reminded me um, <clears throat> of the descriptions of New York in um, the autobiography of Malcolm X, right? Like when he talks about New York and all the ways in which like it changes, like with immigration and stuff. And it reminded me very much of that, that pacing and that detail. And I, and I appreciated that. I was like, oh yeah, I can see that. Um, I would love to hear people's thoughts on um, his relationship to Kim. Um, I don't know, like, and I don't know if it was just me putting this on a, a book from 1937, but like, not just with Kim, I think there's just like a lot of queer coding in this book is what I would say. And I don't know if that was like something that the author put in there. And maybe it was just the way that people related to each other in different ways. Um, but just sort of this attachment and also like the, the, physicality that he has with different people um there's just a lot more like the way that men interacted with each other and and even later some of this this scenes with women too i think um so it and especially as you get towards that the end and i don't want to spoil things for you sheila but like his his deep attachment you know to um to kim was was really interesting i think and that really showed through in the end. Um, yeah, for me, I mean, I think that's that was the most captivating part of the novel is his relationship to Kim and how, like, he signals he's going to meet Kim and this man's going to change his life at the very beginning of, or the very ending of part one. And then we get, like, an entirety of part two where I really think, like, this is amazing. And I noted, I was reading the physical copy and I noted that every time he spoke of Kim, he not he didn't just speak of admiration, but that at one point he used the word love, like he really loved him. He didn't use that for any character, uh, except for the really weird, all of a sudden in love with the woman that felt like an add-on at the very end that made no sense whatsoever. Like in love with the woman he hasn't even met kind of situation. So um, I'm going to throw that out as like heterosexuality coming into the play because someone's scared. But even then, I just thought that long lasting relationship with Kim and being shocked that Kim could be interested in a woman um, at all and, and that he has a romantic life outside of what they know. I just, yeah, I really thought that was very queer coded. And I think he was, as you said, Lucy, surrounded by queer people, right? Like the doctors that he lived with for a while, like those two men were a gay couple. There's no way like these two very successful doctors who get in their, what, what were they only wearing shorts for dinner, half, eating dinner half naked, like every night, there's no way they were not gay. Just, just saying. So yeah, I appreciated the queer coded language. Okay, I'm glad it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't just me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think he was really the only character that 
we got to feel that connection to, or at least that I got to feel that connection to, uh, because we're seeing the world very much through Han's eyes. And so to hear him express such feeling and such, yeah, ad admiration and love, and then uh, following his loss, that that was, and perhaps again, it was me, I was also rushing the clock to get to the end, but listening to the way that he described how he was feeling and the blindsidedness of it all, it, it felt deep in a way that I didn't feel that depth until that point in the book. Um, and I think that that was what I was perhaps missing throughout. I, I spent a lot of time thinking about, well, why am I struggling with this? Um, and I think part of it was there was less focus on human connection or lasting human connection. It, it was more in the passing day to day. Um, and I think I also struggled with, with a, with more modern books, you're often spent kind of wondering, all right, well, what is going to happen next? What could be, where could this be leading? And I didn't find with this, this structure that I was ever able to feel like, oh, I see where we're going now. Um, and I think that those were two things that I struggled with more. And so those those moments of connection or those moments where even where I I was completely wrong, I was there was a moment where I thought, what were the women's name? Van and Trip. I thought they were made up. I thought that the the woman in Laura. Oh boy, the the woman who introduced him to her. Uh, the reason why she didn't want them to meet was because they weren't real. Now, that isn't the case at all. But that was where I was starting to get engaged more with the book because I felt like I could be predicting things. And that, I think, is is what I missed. And boy, I just took this in a sideways direction. But there we No, go. it's totally true. And the whole Laura Ben trip thing was just so bizarre. Like Laura, I could understand as a possible romantic connection because they have these weekly dinners together. But then for him to hear about Trip and Van and suddenly like force Laura's hand and giving him an introduction and going and finding them and and then kind of coercing almost a dinner invitation and then not like all of the signs that says these women are not interested in you and just, yeah. And even for years, just holding on to that. It was, it was so bizarre to me. There's no yeah. mention of him interacting with women up until I guess that point. Um, yeah. And not to say like he didn't, but there's no precursor to that, to a switch being flipped on and said, yes, I want to meet a, a new woman or I want to do this. Like there's no heartbreak. There's no passing like curiosity um, but he goes, I mean, he goes into detail about his relationship with different, primarily men throughout the book, platonic or otherwise. Um, and it's just curious, like, you, like to your point, Fatima, like heteronormativity just needed to be slapped on at the end. Yeah, possibly. And I mean, to be fair to the time period, right? This was a time period when not a lot of women were coming to America or immigrating to America. Um, and with the immigration bans and everything else that was happening, I don't even know that they were allowed to bring their spouses, you know, to America. So, um, so he might not have even had access to women Korean woman or Asian woman, but also his friends didn't seem to mind all that much because they were they were going around with white women and others. They're just like dating and and so so he 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 could have had opportunity to do that as well. I thought yeah when we first when Van and um, Trip were first introduced i i thought they were a couple like i thought that's the direction we were going in and then i think it's really interesting that he picks this attachment to trip without ever having met her just based on this like i feel like we have the same mind um and they meet briefly but then he just holds on to that and i don't even think when you get to that and if you know if he ever if anything ever happens or not, I kind of think no, but then, so part of me is thinking, did he intentionally like, and this, the character, like, is it this choice of a woman 
that is not really even something that's attainable, you know, like to, as you're saying, Fatima, to just actually add this female relationship in there. Um, that that was so interesting to me, but I definitely thought something was up. Like you were saying, Emily, that you thought Van and Trip were made up, and I was like, we're, they're, he's going to tell us any second now, like, you know, how they really um, are a couple. But I thought there were a couple. There was no mention of a third roommate when they were initially introduced and just every though everything. I was like, they're a couple. Even the way he was describing them, where one was like a little bit more masculine in and the other not it's like who knows? But and I'm just gonna Van was all upset. Van Sorry. was all upset when Han showed up asking for trip. And it very much felt like a jealous, why are you here asking for her? But also, why was he there asking for her? It is a stranger who shows up, who kind of knows your friend and is so insistent. That must have been terrifying. Well, but if you look at it from the perspective of this is a world where you just show up with letters of introduction and people welcome you to live in their house. It's it's very much a different world. I would have been so bad at living in that time. Like, you know, if someone rings my doorbell and I'm like, oh, do I <laughs> would not have done well with just here's a letter. Here I am. Can I stay? It just it's that that is such a different um a different time period. Small spoiler for our October read, it also begins with letters of introduction. <laughs> but it, it is a book written in modern times, so much easier to get through. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's like not as much consent involved with a letter of introduction where you're like, Somebody said that you would be able to do this. Can you now at this immediate moment? Um, as opposed to like now, if you do an introductory email or text, you at least have some time to respond and say, no, I I can't. Or yeah, please stay. Um, I think that's the icky feeling. It isn't that people don't want to host. It's we never know what's going on in somebody else's life or what their capacity is. So it feels that's what I think when I'm reading this like how he gets around from place to place. Like it feels very much um, like something could fall through at any moment and you're stuck like what, what with what happened in Canada in Montreal, I think, um, where he was supposed to go visit a, uh, a friend and the friend wasn't there for three days. And so he was just like stuck, didn't know French, people didn't know English well enough. And I thought he was quote, a mute Chinese man and just like took pity on him and let him stay at a hotel. Which his friend then paid for. Like, Amazing. I love it. The hospitality. The the, the sheer expectation of hospitality. It, that, that struck me. I was like, I would never. <laughs> for well, Yeah, it, it, that would be a lot. And it was a nice hotel, too. Yeah. This is in the, the realm of the financial stuff that he's dealing with. I did, as as hard as it was to get going with the book, I did really enjoy the first night that he's there where he's like, I'm going to splurge on a hotel room and it was $2. And then the next day he uh goes for a shave and a haircut without asking how much it costs. And it was a dollar 60. Um, just the like display of the differences in wealth, um, plus the five cent uh, bunkhouse bed that he stayed on. So just showing the breadth of wealth and poverty in New York City in particular was really interesting to me. Yeah, he got super even, detailed oh. about like what everything costs and how much he got paid. And it's like, uh, um, it reminded me. So um, when I was interviewing 
people for my exhibit, um, one of the uncles I interviewed talked about how much he made being a dishwasher at big boys. And I was like, excuse me, like you made, because I think it was like $2 and something cents, right? And I was just like, wow, how did you manage? I mean, but for that time, I think that minimum wage was enough. But then over time in the book, he slowly stops discussing the minutia of money. And it's very much like, oh, you're starting to assimilate economically and understanding that, like how far the dollar goes versus how far the money you brought with you goes. Um, I actually really enjoyed that, like the first few chapters after he gets into gets to New York and he's finding ways to like put off paying for things until he can find a job I'm like that would never happen here now. Um, like you couldn't just like do something um, and on, on credit. Because people are so worked up about how are you going to pay it off? And how, how is anybody going to pay that for this? Um, whether it's me now or you later. Um, and it just feels like while there's a lot of issues, even in those first few chapters, it feels very community oriented of this person needs to survive. Let's like, he'll pay us back. And if he doesn't, we'll figure it out then. Um, I thought like nice to listen to. Like, damn, like this guy gets like a fair, a fair quote unquote shake or at least an attempt at making it whatever that looks like yeah for the most part people aren't trying to take advantage of the uh korean immigrant that's wandering around um versus with mr lively the aforementioned mr lively it's it's hard for me to tell how much of that is trying to take advantage of people who are vulnerable versus this just seems like the way you're supposed to run business and sure you're supposed to have to pay for what you're going to sell and sell to the same people who have been sold the same product multiple times. I think maybe like a little bit of both. I mean, it felt very much like a, a scam. It also, it's like you're going to pay more for this than you're going to make you know, initial, it just, it had just had such that MLM feeling built in, but I can also remember like, um, when my kids were little, there were people who would do like, would want to sell you like this set of books. Um, and even like they, they come into your home, <laughs> ring your doorbell, want to come into your home and talk to you about these books. And it was it, it, even like, as the, um, like it just didn't even seem like a good deal for the person buying them, you know? And it, it was very much like, just sign here. Just, it, just the whole thing felt very fraught and full of, you know, um, it just felt like a scam. But then I also always felt like I was curious about the people selling them. Cause so like, these are people who probably are, you know, have kids at home too, and are just are trying to make money, but this is not a feasible way, but somehow this is being presented as a, as a feasible way. So I don't know if that's like any conclusion about what you were saying. And, but I think that there, there are maybe it, that type of business was done. So it seemed like a way to do business, but I do think that lively seems like he's definitely, um, definitely a little bit of a scammer yeah. the are, audio oh, sorry, go ahead the audiobook that the voice that he does for lively very much makes you know that the narrator thinks he's a little bit of a crook um when i was in college i knew people who were part of a real company that sold books door to door they like sent these freshmen in college out to other parts of the united states for the summer to sell books and they were like textbooks or like study books. Um, I, I like the people I know, I was like, this is a scam, right? Like this doesn't make any sense to anybody. Like who was paying for it? And people would sell them. And I did not, I still don't understand the economics of it. And there's like, it is a pyramid scheme because like, oh, you can move up in different levels. Um, and it's not like a corporate structure. There's like some weird incentive or buyback part of it. Um, and somebody I know who did that, like all four years of college, went with them, like joined them after graduating and now does like uh, executive leadership training. I'm like, my man, you are 33 years old. 
you are not executive leadership training anybody like, and especially not coming from an MLM hard pass. Um, but that was like, it's the same vibes. And again, 80 years apart, we have not learned. Actually, all of the sales jobs that he has had that same vibe, right? When he was working at, is it Bossman or um, the the store the, um, in the Asian department, Asian goods department, Oriental goods. Um, and even when he was describing the um, buyer and the assistant associate buyer and then the, you know, the sellers, whatever. I mean, like even that felt like it when he was describing how like, oh, um, the sellers would get like, what was it? Zero, like a penny per like $2 for every $2 that they managed to sell, they would get a penny back. And I was just like, yeah, even that method where he's trying to show you, like, maybe this is more like a commission-based or even a co-op-based style, or the co-op was the one, the religious people that he was with at the very end. Um, All of those structures just seemed to me like a scam. Like, there was not a single one where I was like, yeah. Um, when he was living with the lively family too, like all the labor they stole from him just from just from giving him board, room and board, right? Expecting him to do everything where he didn't even have time to study. Uh, all of it was so exploitative. I was like, what is happening? This is terrible. Um, yeah. Not only with Han, because when Han comes over, he's on the younger side, just starting off. Um, but I totally just lost my train of thought. I'll pop back in if I remember. I have a question that is sort of like one step back, which is more of just an unerased book club question. But I'm curious when you're looking to pull books, because we read such a wide variety. Uh, what are you what are you looking for? Like, how did this how did this fall on your radar? Um, and like what how do you make this a thing, essentially? <laughs> um, so generally, we look at um, we have like a whole, whole table. So we look at year written um genre book um author like bi uh, biographical information just make sure we have the diversity of types of authors and um specifically ethnicity is what we pull out as like a call out field um and then honestly we like throw a bunch of stuff onto the table or into the board doc or, or the google doc and we move things around and we figure out what like as we read summaries what rounds out what we have read, what pushes us in different directions. Um, what is stuff we, like this year, I think I read maybe three of the books beforehand. So all of these, like in previous years I've read or between Fatima and I, we have actually read all of them. Um, this year, that's not the case. Um, so we're really moving our collect, like between the two of us moving towards challenging ourselves as readers and not trying to preempt what readers will think about the books we pick. I think we've established ourselves well enough as to hopefully a trustworthy curation source that even if it's like, because like Fatima said at the beginning, this could have gone off the rails very fast. Um, and it didn't, which is great for everybody because we have a really rich text to discuss. But the October read, for instance, was hot trash, uh, was very bad. I spent, I read it, uh, I read three pages, I was like, absolutely not. We're gonna have to change this out. Um, and that's just how it is sometimes. But um, this book, I don't know, Fatima, if I just like, if one of us Googled it, older books and we're like, hey, this seems promising or or if something if somebody recommended it. Um, I think it was you. Yeah. And one other thing is like, we also ask our book club members if they've read things that they would want to discuss at book club. And um, <clears throat> some of our book club members are genre readers. So like they read widely in a specific genre. So like romance, for example. So our romance recommendations have been coming from the same book club member for several years now. Um, someone reads very much in fantasy. So we try to capture that too. So ultimately, like the calls are really about trying to meet 
a wide variety of things so that we can um we can have good representation and i feel really fortunate to be able to like have so much like so many genres represented but also just like so much asian american literature to even tap into like that that feels really really cool to me i don't think we would have had that even a decade ago or even the resources to find older older books um because the writing's there it's just a matter of knowing who the right author is or how to pull that out of well now the internet um and it actually the article um that we sent with this this month's book club introduction email uh talks about that a little bit where um there was an anthology that came out in the 90s that pulled back out other older well what was then older asian american writing and this wasn't even on the list or wasn't part of the anthology because it wasn't seen as asian american and so um emily i think you brought up this point of between you and Fatima, like the um, all everything being set in New York or in the U.S., but not so much having any flashbacks in Korea or not having any of the more context of Asian-ness. Um, it's it was uh, Kong's in uh, attempt at explaining or exploring what does being Asian in America mean outside of being Asian in America who goes back to Asia um, or like has like a one foot in Asia. Um and so it's wild that this Asian American anthology didn't see this as an attempt at moving the literature into Asian America away from just Asian in America. And I was really glad to see in the book that he actually addresses this at the end where he says, like, if I were to go back to Asia now, I would become an exile there, just like I had been an exile in America for so long. And so it was almost like he'd become too Americanized to to go back to Asia. And I, and I appreciate that because I could see that too um, in, in a lot of his, I guess, experiences and having lived there for as long as he has. Yeah. I think um, I read, or I heard in an interview with um, Ed Park, who's an author, and then he wrote an article about this too, but he was saying that the working title of this, I think was, um, the the subtitle was death of an exile which is really interesting if you think about it because it could mean like so many different things in that like you're saying about he would have been in exile when he went back but also like he as does he assimilate enough it just it's interesting that that didn't stay and i think it probably had to do with like um it, as a selling point or or a publishing and that wouldn't have been as interesting or you know or would have seemed more um controversial i don't know but I, I thought that it was really interesting and very informative to learn that that's like what he was calling it in his mind as he was writing it yeah and i feel like that title had more levels to it to interpretation in relation to the book than the present title like it could have also meant kim in a, in a lot mm -hmm. of ways you know um uh, it just yeah there's so many so many ways in which it would have applied so i'm i'm i don't know uh east coast west i suppose it's just yeah maybe that sold more books it's hard to say yeah i mean he had to do what he had to do to get that sweet sweet citizenship <laughs> never came mm, so so true yeah um, something, uh, this is a small part of the book, but uh, towards the beginning, um, one of the ways that Han is able to kind of create his bona fides with other, uh, specifically Chinese, um, Americans is writing in nice calligraphy, uh, writing Chinese poetry and that kind of, I mean, it may come back later, but at least at the halfway mark where I'm at, it kind of goes away and this, um, his internal or his like want to keep up that part of himself uh, or like that his the way he understands his own culture just flits away he, um and he doesn't think about writing in korean or chinese or japanese the languages that he's com comfortable in but he thinks about writing in english and writing poetry in english um and that feels very timeless where even like a lot of asian american authors whether professional 
hobbyists or very recreational um, don't necessarily think about writing fully in another language that they may know. Um, the language that they know is like seen as home language or conversational language. It's not literary language. Um, and I saw a comment on Facebook, this was months ago, like if for people who read and write in Hindi, they don't speak critically in Hindi. They don't understand like heavy, like more intensive words to describe their feelings or reactions or emotions to works of art. That's always in English. Um, and it feels like that, I guess like, I, I can't think of the right word, but there is a distance like language, like cultural languages, uh, culture and language um, are very tied together and they are, can be like worlds apart in how you live your life. Um, and I'm just like realizing that in this book, how it plays out in his life where he gets a little bit, like if he meets other people who value the same culture that he does, he'll partake, but he doesn't try to do it on his own. Actually, and he, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was saying he has such a vast knowledge of like, um, you know, English, you know, like the English canon of, of poetry and I mean, so much so that it's like that seems to be where he turns and and is that and that seems to contribute to, to the loss of like looking at the at the the poetry and the literature of his own culture um i was going to mention that i'd recently just finished reading an anthology of, um of essays by writers of color i think it's called writing in color and in it, there's a lot of international authors who talk about their decision to write in English and how writing in English is what gave them legitimacy in their countries, um, as opposed to when they were trying to write in their native tongue and made very little to no progress as writers or even being able to be published. And so I thought that was just yet another way there's like this hierarchy and like, you know, privilege associated with having English as one of your languages. Yeah. Awesome. We are coming at the top of the hour, so I just want to see, are there any last thoughts about this book that you wanted to share? Okay. It I am, is. I'm glad to have read it. Yeah. So. It's a challenging read, but it is uh worth reading and really should work its way into some american history classes thank you so much for um giving the book a try for reading it um and yes it was definitely one of our more challenging reads but um i'm so glad that to have also read it because i feel like i gained a lot of perspective um here for that time period and uh, next month, we are reading poetry. Um, we are reading Megan Fernandez's uh, book. Uh, title is escaping me just at the moment. Um, I do everything I'm told. So um, hope, we look forward to chatting with you then. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.